the world covered in gold. Written and read by Philip Corker. Gold is something else. You can do things with it that can't be achieved with other materials. In particular, there is one thing you can do with gold that shouldn't even be attempted with any other ore. You can, with the right hammer and the right frame of mind, flatten a typical bar of gold into a sheet only a few atoms thick. If you had nothing better to do, you might wonder how much ground you could cover with this gleaming shawl. A double bed. A small garden, a football pitch, the Amazon basin? No, you could cover the world in gold. Wrap up that glorious blue tragedy in yellow foil, and hang it from a Christmas tree. I doubt that this is true, but a part of me has always believed it to be at least theoretically possible. Partly because I like the idea, but also because Old Man Hague told me as much when I was twelve, or was it fourteen? Not that he whispered it in my ear like a mystical secret. No, he announced it with total conviction to the class I was in. Though when I say I was in my class, I just mean that I was there in an absent kind of way. I didn't notice people most of the time, and people generally didn't notice me. One thing I have noticed about people is how much they smell. Some people smell of sex. Some people smell of fear. Some people smell of money, of confidence, or good health. Others give off a sunset haze of eternal failure, chronic hope, or repetitious loss. Any aroma can be detected in a crowd: petrol, plastic, rust, empty jars, tobacco tins, warm fruit, sweet shops, coffee, a wild garden in June. So many odors that by the middle of our lives we are completely intoxicated by it all. And by the end, are thoroughly worn out by it. Old Man Hague had a smell which filled his classroom and followed him down the corridors. It was stronger than the disturbing scent of liver and cabbage which snaked out of the kitchens. I can smell it now: physics, chemistry, the pungent fumes of the scientific soul. In spite of this, Hague had something which the lamentable parade of his peers. Were colossally devoid of, the ability to make a lifelong impression on the imagination of a boy who was eternally elsewhere. While the fake wisdom of his colleagues fell from my shoulders before the dinner bell, I have never forgotten the story of gold, nor have I ever wished to. It was the luminous pearl in the night of my school days, absurd, beautiful, madly poetic. Last night. I told my wife the story of gold. She closed her eyes and nestled into the pillow as the precious metal began to spread beneath my words, over our bed, down the stairs and into the garden, through the streets and the fields, across the old seaways and the hidden lakes, flexing and flowing above the skyscrapers, the sacrificial forests and the starry hills. And as it went, I said, it brought a final rest to everything. To working, to laughing, to loving, to wishing and searching, to planning and to waiting, to the playground and the battleground, to the classroom and the torture room, to either end of the game and to both sides of the hunt. That's a nice story," she said, with her eyes still closed. "It's my favourite story," I said. I didn't realise till now. I waited for her eyes to open, but they were bolted from the inside. And dreams were already on her breath. I'm going to sleep now," she said, and she slipped away like a patient under the needle. I've never understood how she does that. It's an art that passed me by, like dowsing, card tricks, and levitation. Either way, I feel alone when she goes so quickly, and sometimes I have to search for a pretext to wake her, and then feel like a child for doing so. Go to sleep. She says, in a low, tormented growl. I let her go. Suddenly, I'm at my schoolboy desk again, drifting between Andromeda, the cat's eye, the crab, and the great spiral. Oh, the universe! That glamorous hellhole of beauty and sorrow, superimposed on a room of strange children. 
In the distance, through the glare of test tubes and blurred formulas, an orange light flares up from the void. It might be a new supernova a million light years away, but it's just old man Haig with another cigarette. I hear his half-mad voice at the edge of the sad, sane world. I have a little theory, he says, which you won't find in any textbook. Outside, some dogs are at it with formidable energy. Two fourth formers grab a secret kiss, which everyone knows about. A seagull lands on the roof of the gym. An ambulance goes by. An old woman stares at a blossom tree. I'm hypnotised and hooked with no idea. None of it has anything to do with me, and the whole bloody thing is a complete mystery. But it's my mystery. I look at my wife, and wonder how I ever made the journey from science room to bedroom. Sometimes it seems that my life never really happened, but is just a random collection of thoughts I had in the middle of some daily event, sitting in the garden shade, walking to the shops, putting on a record, or calling up the stairs to the woman beside me now. Sometimes I wake with my eyes locked tight, and I don't know where I am, why I am, or who I am, only that I am, or I'm meant to be. I could be in any of the houses I've ever lived in, or any of the lives I've inhabited and outgrown. But I'm not really anything or anyone. I have no location, no identity. For a few seconds, I'm pure, primal, unadorned. I'm not me. I'm just a white bone of a floating mind, stripped clean of memory and self-knowledge, light years away from a lifetime of jobs and money, of lovers and friends and family, of birthdays and holidays, of good days and bad days, of every kiss, every embrace, and every senseless spiralling passion that ever set me free or weighed me down. Perhaps it's the only true and natural condition, and part of me is at home with it, but it's also unnerving and frightens me back into my everyday focus. In a moment the scattered jigsaw is sucked back into place. My mind jolts, my eyes open. Suddenly I'm me again, resurfaced from the void. I take a deep breath and hold my wife tightly. She puts her arms around me. Are you all right? she asks. I was lost again. Well, you're not now, she says. She is never lost, which is just as well. Now she is fast asleep. I smell her hair and wonder where she is. Her hair smells like a secret wood at the end of May. But it's not her real smell. No, her real smell is salvation. She is the one person in the world I would never want to escape from. I reach over her to turn out the lamp, but the particles of dust floating above it like plankton stop me. They remind me of another smell, another person, the one person in the world I never could escape from, even if I wanted to, which I don't. I'm not sure of the connection. It's one of those instantaneous subconscious things that strike from any angle, at any time and any place. Perhaps it's the thought of coal dust rising from a mine shaft but the image generates an unmistakable redolence. The old man. Not old man Haig. No. I mean the real old man. The only old man. The one I carry around with me. My father. <laughs>